Uh, hi, Lewis. Welcome to Movie Junk. How are you? Hi, Zay. I'm good. Good. You? Doing well, doing well. We have Lewis Hertham joining us today. You fans of HBO's Westworld know quite well. Uh, you're also on Amazon Prime's The Peripheral, True Blood, and so many exciting projects. I can't thank you enough for joining us today. My pleasure, pal. Thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I want to jump into, you know, obviously all of your exciting projects, but with over, you know, 45 years of experience in the business, um, I'd be doing our fans a disservice if we, and also since it's the first time and hopefully the first of many, love to hear how the journey first started for you. If we can take us back all the way to the beginning. <laughs> well, we'd have to go all the way back to 1968, actually, when I was 12 years old, my dad uh, took me to see the movie Bullet. Steve McQueen. And that movie inspired me to go into show business, but not as an actor. I The car chase is what inspired me, and I wanted to be a stunt driver. I wanted to be a stunt man, but the thing that really intrigued me was that car chase. So I sort of, you know, I just uh, lived that dream all through school. And then towards, uh, let's see, after I graduated high school, I went to college briefly, knew I didn't want to didn't really need college. I knew I was going to, they didn't teach you how to do stunts and at LSU. So, so I went there briefly. And uh, shortly after that, I started, I was working at a men's clothing store, a fine men's clothing store. And they asked me to start doing some of their modeling for them, their, their TV commercials. And I started doing that. One thing led to another, it led to getting an agent in town uh, in, in Baton Rouge, where I'm from. And, uh, that sort of just sort of propelled me into acting. Uh, my agent there, Dee Cawthorn, she handed me a script one day and uh, I hadn't done any stage acting or anything. And she said, uh, why don't you go audition for this play at the little theater where they were doing uh, in Richard Nash's The, the Rainmaker. And uh, I said, I, I don't, you know, I don't think I'm ready to do something like that. And she said, well, you know, read it, just read it. So I read it and it was fantastic. And there's a part of the, of the younger brother, Jimmy, and it's a it's a smaller part. She said, just go read for it. You know, and I said, you know, if I don't have the guts to do this, I mean, how am I going to drive 100 miles an hour and flip cars and do jump off of buildings and all the things that I envisioned myself doing? So I went and read for it. And lo and behold, I ended up getting the lead. Wow. And that changed my life because I realized that this was something that I really could do and enjoyed immensely. So I went straight from doing the Rainmaker into doing Oklahoma, playing Will Parker at the local dinner theater, which uh, again, I'd never sung for anyone. So that was a, 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 an experience. Uh, and then right from that, right after that, I did uh, Greece. I played Kanicki in Greece, which was a, an amazing experience. It was a wonderful cast and we had a just amazing time. And so having that camaraderie in, in the theater to, because to me, the theater is the most pure form of acting there is, you know, you get one shot at it. So I, uh, while I was doing Greece, uh, a friend of mine um, who was a model uh, at the same agency, she had, uh, we had talked about moving to Los Angeles that we both wanted to. And she called me and she said, I'm moving to Los Angeles. I need a roommate. I said, well, I'm doing this play, but when I'm done with the play, it, you know, uh, I'll come be your roommate. So I was very fortunate to have uh, her name's Julie, that she came out and she set up the house and everything. So when I finished the play, I was able to just come out and hit the ground running in the January of 82. So I've been here ever since. Uh, then I, you know, like every actor, just started the struggle. I started taking classes with Margie Haber. Uh, Cole reading classes, which I recommend to any actor. She's fantastic. She's here in LA. Uh, and after, oh, just a few months, I, I mean, I, I was 25 years old. I'd never been away from Baton Rouge for more than a few weeks, you know, on vacation. And I, I was two or three months into my stay here and I was getting a little homesick. So I went home for a visit. And while I was there, I got a job on the film, uh, The Toy, with Richard Pryor right. and Jackie Gleason. Yep, yep, classic. A classic, and but here's the thing, it was like when I, I there was no role for me to read for that my agent back there, Dee, 
but she was doing the casting, but she said, maybe I can get you a, a job on the crew and, you know, you can end up getting your SAG card somehow. So the only job they had left when I met with the production manager was uh, Jackie Gleason's stand in. So believe it or not, I was Jackie Gleason's stand in for that film. Wow. So you were Jackie Gleason's character for a little bit. Well, I mean, I stood there, you know, for the lighting, you know, what stand-ins do. Uh, I, I had a lot of interactions with him, obviously. Um, very interesting man. It was towards the end of his life. He only did one movie after that movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was not what I would say well. Um, yeah, it was a little cantankerous, but I mean, I kind of understand it because he, he spent a lot of time waiting. And, um, but uh, the funny thing, part about how I got my SAG card is there was a scene and there is a scene in the movie and it's a movie that would never get made today. I mean, because of what happens in the, in the movie, Richard Pryor is bought by, by Jackie Gleason's character for his son's amusement. Yep. Yep. But, but he's delivered to the house in a crate. Yeah. <laughs> Packaged. Yep. And a big, you know, wooden crate. And so, uh, the day we were shooting the scene where Jackie comes in, where the kid, uh, Scotty Schwartz, comes in to open the crate, and then Gleason comes in because there's all the the Fraulein, which was their maid, their housekeeper or whatever, was uh, carrying on uh, telling Eric to come finish his dinner or else he couldn't open the crate till tomorrow. Well, Richard wasn't there that day. So Richard Donner, the director, asked me to read Richard's lines from inside the box. Wow. And so he said, so here's the script and go and run the lines with Jackie. So there I find myself running lines with Jackie Gleason. It was a, it was, you know, it was pretty amazing. Uh, what's going on here? Sorry. All kind of things are popping up here oh, on my yeah. computer. Sorry. So I read the lines with Jackie. And then when I got in the box and we got ready to shoot it, he said, Richard Donner came over and he said, now be sure to leave enough space between your lines and Richard, so we can dub in his voice. And I had listened, I was a huge Richard Pryor fan. I listened to all his albums and I kind of did Richard Pryor impressions. I mean, you know, as best that I could. So I was thinking, well, you know what? Let me just do this the way I think Richard would do it. And the very first line that he had in the box was help all caps with about five exclamation marks. So he's obviously shouting. So when the Fraulein comes in and says, Eric, if you don't finish your dinner, you will, you'll not open this till tomorrow. And I, and I just said, help, help. you know, I just like, and then I did the whole, all the lines in my per, my best uh, Richard Pryor uh, impersonation. And uh, Donner got a kick out of it. The crew got a kick out of it. And he pulled me out of the box, patted me on the back. He said, oh, you did a great job in your film debut. And I said, well, do I get a side card now? And, and he, he said, you want one? I said, yeah. And he said, put him on the day player list. So man in the box. That's how I got my side card. That's amazing. I mean, pretty much, you know, your first feature film, you know, you're standing <laughs> in Jackie Gleason. You're also portraying Richard Pryor. Did you end up getting to meet Richard Pryor at all? Or Oh, yeah. No, I worked with him for three yeah. months. And yeah, what, was, he, what, was, what was he like? He was, uh, you know, it's weird. I, I thought that I, I didn't really know what to expect. I thought Gleason, because of seeing Gleason through all the years, you know, uh, the honeymooners and everything else that I'd seen him in, cantankerous and, uh, or not cantankerous, but uh, bigger than life, you know, and maybe a little cantankerous, but um, I thought he would be cracking jokes all the time and having a lot of fun. And Richard, I thought would be more solemn. Yeah. He's exactly the opposite wow yeah and uh but it, it was uh it was quite an experience it really was i mean what but watching gleason work uh was was just uh fascinating because you know he 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 would imbibe a little bit um and uh he would seem not always uh, that chipper about being there but man when when Donner said action, I mean, boom, he was there hundred percent and just completely uh, present. Yeah. So it was, uh, but you know, I worked with uh, three legends, you know, cause Richard Donner was a legend too. You just recently lost him too. Yeah. 
Yeah, wow. we just recently lost him. And, you know, from our understanding, too, he was getting ready to work on uh, Lethal Weapon 5. Yep. Yep. Right? That's so what I, I heard, think, too. Yeah, I think Mel has taken over the uh, the reins, uh, which we know is obviously a brilliant uh, director as well, too. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah hopefully, really hopefully we could still see that project and, you know, we get it in memory of, of Richard Donner. But, I mean, what an amazing story for your first project, getting be, getting yeah. able to uh, get your SAG card as well. And um, one thing I wanted to to mention, kind of, you, you mentioned- get residuals from that, like two cents, but, you know. We'll take it. We'll take it, right? And, and I know you mentioned that, you know, you, you kickstarted your career in 68, and then I believe in 73 is when the original Westworld came out with Yul Brenner and um yeah. also you know we we later learned that you know Arnold sort of took some inspirations to what he did in the Terminator from the West World um which you also starred so did you um I'm assuming you obviously saw the original absolutely I, I remember it very well um you know I was uh 17 I guess when that came out and it was so ahead of its time and so disturbing you know because uh and and I've watched it recently. In fact, right, right. Uh, when I was, I don't remember if it was before or after I auditioned for Westworld that I watched it again. Uh, but I'd watched it many times and and it was kind of interesting that watching it again, I realized I must've watched this movie more times than I thought. Cause I knew everything that was coming lines and everything. But, uh, yeah. Um, it was it was uh like i say it was ahead of its time and and it was kind of disturbing and uh so but i was extremely excited when i got the call from my manager that i was going to read for westworld and and i said what they're doing a remake of the film and he goes no they're they're doing a tv series and uh so yeah i got pretty excited just the opportunity you know to to read for it and there was so many uh, amazing uh, stars that were on the show over over the uh, all the mm -hmm. series, and you know you worked with the legend himself, Anthony mm -hmm. Hopkins, and um, I definitely want to know what that experience was like. But a lot of people, uh, and and you were brilliant, brilliant on the show as well. But a lot of people say that you stole that mm -hmm. scene or that the show with him, right? So um, what was it like, first of all, you know, working on the show, and what can you say about the man himself? Well, the, working on the show was certainly a highlight of my career without question. Uh, and uh, not just because of the actors, the level of the actors that I work with, but because of Jonah Nolan and Lisa Joy and uh, Athena Wickham and uh, and the whole production crew, uh, Richard Lewis. They're, they're all just wonderful, wonderful people and down to earth, uh, solid human beings, you know, and don't always get that in this business. But uh they they truly were just such a delight to work with, and of course they're doing the peripheral too. So um, I'm I'm uh, honored to to still be working with them. As far as uh, working with uh, Tony, as he likes to be called, um, that was uh, again a highlight, not just from an acting standpoint, but just from a sort of a uh, a, a human standpoint, or just like you know, they, you know what they say, be, um, I forget the saying, you might be able to help me with it, but, um, be careful about wanting to meet your heroes. Cause a lot of times you're disappointed, yep. uh, no disappointment here. In fact, he was so beyond my expectation of just being so giving and everything. I'll, I'll address what you said about people saying that I stole that scene. Well, first of all, it was my scene. It was my character scene. He had very few words and, and all he was doing was just quizzing me and, and, um, and people say, Oh, it had to be so difficult. You're doing that scene with this brilliant actor. And I said, no, that's what made it so much easier. He was so giving and gave me such a per just like attention. I mean, you, I will tell you this, the close-ups, the, the coverage in that scene was what we shot very the very first thing we shot. You know, usually you shoot a wide or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, Jonah came up to me and said, "Look, I'm going to shoot uh, Tony's coverage first. And I went, "Absolutely, I, whatever." You know, so I gave well, I gave 100 percent in that performance. You know, that all the machinations that I went through and it was very physical too. Because to get that kind of stuff, you have to kind of tense every muscle in your body. 
But when you see him in, in his coverage, when he's looking at me, he's seeing it for the first time. And right. I can see, cause I know that I can see how, uh, how much he was concentrating, but also, I mean, I, it's hard to describe if people haven't really experienced it, but there was a generosity of spirit that he was giving me and transferred. Yep. Yeah. And, and, uh, after the very first take, he went. And from then it was like, you know, I, I was completely relaxed. I was very prepared. I will say that I had very, I was very, very much prepared, but we shot that scene all day. And by the way, that scene was three pages longer than it appears. It was an eight page scene and it was, which would have been about eight minutes and it's about five minutes. So they cut a good bit of it out. Uh, but it works. I mean, and and it didn't lose anything by the, the pieces that they removed, which they had actually added only a few days before. And Jonah asked if, it, you know, what I thought about it. I said, you can put anything you want in it. I'll do it, <clears throat> you know, and be happy to. So he was, uh, but we, we had a great time because between scenes, you know, he told me stories about his growing up in Wales. And the first time he went and knocked on Richard Burton's door. He was 15 years old and he knocks on Richard Burton's door and Burton comes to the door. What do you want, lad? He's like, sir, I wonder if I could get an autograph. And he gave him the autograph. And then 20 years later, he replaced him in Lion and Winter on Broadway. And Burton remembered him. You're the lad who came to my door. <laughs> and, that's and he's a wonderful, uh, he, he does wonderful impressions. He was doing impressions of Rod Steiger and Burton and and others and just a wonderful wonderful man wonderful human being uh brilliant soul um and again I say to people that say it must have been hard uh, I I say I've worked with several big actors even Oscar winning actors who would have made that a, a lot more difficult than it needed to be he made it much easier um yeah. yeah. And, and he also, from what I've uh, listened to some of his interviews, you know, he does come off as um, kind of being a little bit more, at least in the interviews, like he's more like reserved and kind of doesn't really socialize with a lot of, you know, friends. I think you know, he had mentioned that most of his friends were like the ones that his wife's friends were. Yep. Um, so he kind of right. keeps to himself, but just, you know, his work over the years. And he also had a little bit of a late resurgence, right? Like that Hannibal role. Um mm -hmm. Which you know, I, I think like you know, kind of came out of nowhere uh, for him. Is he is he anything like Hannibal, or is that just him being a brilliant actor? No, he's like I mean, if you see him in any of his interviews, that's that's very much what he's like. He's very down to earth. But uh, but speaking of Hannibal, I I want to share this is a brilliant moment as well. I mean, anytime you're around him, you're going to have memorable moments. Period. Uh, he's one of those people that does not waste words and everything out of his mouth is a gem. But we were all sitting around at lunch one day and, and, you know, crew members were sitting around. He, he would eat lunch with us. You know, he didn't go to his trailer and eat lunch. Everybody would eat lunch in the, in the mess hall on the studio or whatever you want to call it. And we started talking about Hannibal and he, you know, he, I can't remember exactly how he said the whole process went. I, I don't, I think he actually had to audition for it or he didn't have to audition, uh, but he sent some little tiny little clip or he did something that they went, oh yeah, he's the right guy. Maybe it was somebody that thought he wasn't the right guy, but he did some tiny little thing and they went, yes, he's the right guy. So we were talking about Hannibal and how it was this new kind of villain in movies it was a it was a a different kind of villain and so we kind of got into that and talked about other villains that were similar and everything had a wonderful discussion going and out of the blue he just went i ate his liver with i, I ate his liver with some fava oh. beans and a nice chianti <laughs> and he oh. just did it and we were all like and I would never forget this. One of the prop guys was walking by with his tray and he went, he stopped and he went, did I just hear that? You yeah. know, so it was great. So he's like, I, I could speak about him for a, a long time and it's nothing but praise. And 
the first time that I met him, uh, I got the word on a Thursday that I got the job and I got the word that I was playing Peter Abernathy and I didn't know who Peter Abernathy was. I didn't audition for Peter Abernathy, but we audition. You audition for a role. I, I audition for another role and I won't say which, but, um, you also had to do the scene that I do with Anthony Hopkins. Every man that male that that auditioned did a they they had different characters and different dialogue, but it was that scene with Dr. Ford putting a glitching robot through its paces. So uh, I I did the audition, and then it was weeks before. Wait a minute, no, it was about a week before I got called back to do it again. And I had really prepared it. And I did very much what you see in the in the in the show because I had quite a bit of time to prepare for it. Sitting in this chair right here, I found that <laughs> that kind of hip cupping thing, which kind of put it made it all come together for me. But um uh gosh, I lost my train of thought. Um so oh gosh, because I when I think about this, I think about so many uh different things uh preparation you were doing for yeah no when i when i okay so i i then like i was talking my manager called me on a thursday and to tell me that a job that i had auditioned for was not going to go our way sorry lou it's not going to go our way this is weeks after westworld audition and he said but you know we still have westworld and i went that's still in the works and he goes yep and then i was waiting for more and he didn't say any more and i went okay that's fine because i like i don't push if you know if if they say there's something still possible i just leave it at that next day i get the call that was a friday then they call me and ask me if i could come in monday to rehearse with sir anthony hopkins jeffrey wright in that scene and just basically read through it is basically what we did so when I got to the, to the set, we did it at the Melody Ranch in one of the, you know, on the Western set in one of the buildings. Jonah comes out, introduces himself. I walk in there. There's Jeffrey Wright, who is also another brilliant actor and a wonderful uh -huh. human being. Uh, yeah, just another legend, really. Uh, he's become that. And um, he introduces me to uh, Lewis, uh, meet Sir Anthony Hopkins, and the first words out of his mouth was, call me Tony. And he insists that everybody call him Tony. He's that down to earth. And so we're reading that, and I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm kind of geeking out. You know, I'm sitting here with Jonah Nolan, uh, Anthony Hopkins, Jeffrey Wright, and then walks, and then in walks J.J. Abrams. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, holy moly. So, yeah, it was quite an experience. But I, I, I have to also say that working with Evan Rachel Wood was also a highlight of that show. The, she's just spectacular. And we had a chemistry that just sort of manifested itself anytime we were we did a lot of emotional scenes together. And uh, there were they were always there to this day, like in the second season, when she finds me in the fort and comes into the uh comes into the room and i'm on the cot that that's one of my favorite scenes of my entire career there's just yeah. something really special about it no i mean the the chemistry was great and, and evan rachel wood i mean she's become a brilliant i mean she's been a brilliant actress for several years but you know, i think one of the first movies that i saw her in was in the movie 13 she was also really good in the wrestler um so yeah she's just awesome awesome and everything that she does um, and he was yeah. also in a little film a buddy of mine, J. Todd Harris, produced uh, called Digging the China, even before that with Kevin Bacon. She was a little bitty girl. Oh, before 13? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Pretty sure. Pretty sure. You'd have to look that up. But she was 13. very young. 13, she was already a teenager. So she was a kid then. Yeah, I, I think Digging the China was before that. Wow. I, I and, could be wrong. And, but. and Jeffrey Wright uh, with Westworld, this was, I think... Uh, um uh, after um he had already been done with boardwalk empire uh too. i think yes. that's where he finished uh yeah he's dr narcisse yeah that show yeah i know brilliant i i do want to jump into the uh the peripheral um which again is a hit show on amazon prime You're working with uh, chloe grace and jj field and when yeah. i first saw the trailer you know this was very much for me it kind of gave me like total recall and matrix vibes and this is 
way different, right, from what you were doing on the West World. You know, you play the villain, and uh, it's a little bit of a shift. But uh, was mm-hmm. it was it natural for you to to come into this character? And um, also, how did you um, hear about this role? You had that relationship with the creators before, but um, was it easy for you to transition to this role? Um, well, actually, the uh, when I when I finished my time on Westworld, it, it was mentioned to me that they had this show and that they wanted to talk to me about uh, a role. Uh, I think it's about the first time in my entire career where somebody actually came through when they said they were going to do something like that. But that's the kind of people they are. Um, so as far as the shift, um, no, nah, I wouldn't say it was difficult. I mean, people bring that up all the time because the characters were so incredibly different. But if you think about Peter Abernathy at the end of that first, the the end of the uh, scene with Anthony Hopkins in the pilot, he's gets pretty scary or nasty you know he he's uh i have friends that are still a little freaked out by that that scene when i look up and say you know to meet my maker and then threaten them um but i've played bad guys before i've played bad really some pretty nasty guys in uh little independent movies that really nobody has seen and um i think after so many years doing this and uh, uh, you know, I'm certainly a better actor today than I was when I started. I'm certainly a better actor today than I was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. Uh, well, I hope so, at least five years ago. I don't know. But you, you, you know, I. Uh, plus, this guy is a kind of a redneck kind of guy. He's a, I, I grew up in Louisiana um, yeah, yeah. and I, you know, I I know similar people, you know. No similar people. They're, they're they can be charming and suave, but they're kind of scary sometimes. And they do they take they've taken the road of corruption and criminality, um, and often get away with it uh, because they wield power. You know. Yeah, and the production. I mean, it just looks so well, right? With Amazon Prime, I mean, really, um, you know, with everything that goes into this. I mean, this has you know better than movie quality type of um you know production so um yeah definitely i mean it's it's one of the highest rated shows on amazon prime and mm-hmm. i really um you know enjoy watching it and um my i, I tell you what just to what you're saying the premiere you know because you watch it on a tv set even even if it's a big screen but at the premiere we showed the pilot on a, a you know on a movie theater in a massive screen and you're you're right it is quality stunning and and it, it to see it on the, I wish everyone could see this whole series on a big screen because it's definitely made for I mean it holds up on a massive screen so yeah but that's that's Jonah and Lisa they they settle for nothing less you know I do I do want to sneak in a question and um I'm I'm hoping that maybe I'm one of the first uh people to or interviewers to uh, to ask you but um, I'm a huge fan of the uh, the Breaking Bad universe, and you snuck mm. in on us on that snuck show. In. That's you. I did. You're, you're the realtor, and the reason why I always oh, really? remembered um, that character was because you know we get the flashback scene where we see Walter and Skyler first buying the house, right? But what was unique is you can tell Walter and Skyler are outside, and the realtor is just kind of waiting. He's kind of like prepping a little bit, and then lets them in. And you can just tell that you were a senior realtor and you even let them come in and kind of do their own thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, one question is, do you partially feel responsible for allowing Heisenberg to get into the neighborhood, which he eventually became the teacher uh, and met um, obviously uh, Jesse? (laughs) Well, since you bring it up, yeah, sure. I'm responsible. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's funny. I, I have to tell you about that scene. Um, an, another brilliant man in stand up uh, to me uh to me the entire series looking from the standpoint of the entire series uh what six years what was it six years something like that yeah they had uh, an a and b so i think it was six, seven years yeah right uh i think it's one of the most brilliant and best tv series ever to me westworld's season 1 uh, not that I disparage in any way the other seasons, but season one, I think, was a mo- one of the most brilliant seasons of television 
ever because it was unique and exciting and different. But yeah, that I was a huge uh, fan of the show, you know, from the from the first from the pilot. So I was thrilled to get even that small part. And uh, the interesting thing that they were trying to portray there was that Walter was, you know, a kind of hip guy. You know, he had the leather jacket and he was very kind of nonchalant and talking about Sandia. And, you know, and I'm like, hey, you know, I gave you that idea. Don't forget, you know, and and being a goofball. But he was being a real cool customer. Now, there was another scene that we shot because I walk outside, if you recall, and I said, I'll give you all a chance to, you know, give you some privacy. Well, they come outside in another scene and we have a little exchange and then they get in his convertible brown bronze Porsche. Wow. And the whole thing, you know, look what he was driving throughout the show. Yeah. But he was driving a Porsche, a convertible Porsche. And that part of that, like Vince Gilligan was saying is that we want to show that he was a kind of a cool guy, you know, and we never, we never got to see that. And I, I was, uh, I was disappointed just for the character's sake, not because uh, one of my scenes got cut, but I thought it was it was a really cool thing that he was doing. But yeah. you know, time. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder why uh, the the choice, and obviously, like you have to you know cut to a certain amount of time in order to fit the uh, the episode. And um, yeah, I mean that would have been interesting to see, right? Because we're seeing him with the hair; he's very hip. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a it's bitter. It's, it's sad, right? Because you're seeing what could have been uh, with his character, right? He could have been, if he didn't sell his share um, of the company, obviously, right? So he obviously would have been, you know, wealthy and wouldn't have had to make the decisions. Who knows? Maybe he would have never even gotten the cancer. I always felt like maybe he got the cancer working at the car wash with the chemicals. Yeah. But or I stress or, you know, the stress of, of knowing. And, and quite frankly, the, I mean, I would imagine someone that, sold off their ownership in something that would have made them mega wealthy that has to play on your mind yeah every day uh, every day <laughs> yeah every day uh, i've made some bad uh stock choices you know and a few of them that have not left me but you know did, not, did not like him not not that bad i i imagine you were a fan of the uh, better call saul series did you watch that I am not finished watching that. And of course, uh, Patrick Fabian is a good buddy of mine because we did The Last Exorcism together uh, back in 2009, I think it was. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's brilliant too. Anything uh, Vince Gilligan touches really. And then of course, you, how can you go wrong with uh, Bob Odenkirk and and the, 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 the cast and, and the crew too, because the crew is a lot of the same people. I... Um, yeah, I there's just so much to watch. And I'll be honest with you, I don't watch as much as I used to watch TV itself. Um so yeah, no, Patrick they doesn't see this. <laughs> no, he and he was he was amazing. I mean, I don't want to spoil uh anything. Yeah, no spoilers. Show, because... It's it's definitely a slow burn. Um, it's definitely has a different pace, at least in the first few seasons than Breaking Bad. But it's got its own storyline. I know um, a lot of people think it's better than Breaking Bad. Exactly. And we've actually interviewed um, you know, a few of the um Better Call Saul cast. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, definitely like when I was watching it, you know, you there's nothing, I would say that everything that you hope to see in a prequel series to Breaking Bad, they yeah. deliver for you. And and more. And yeah. more. It it stands on its own. Uh, El Camino was really good too. D did you see El Camino? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I loved, loved it. it. It was, man, what a! I, I thought it was kind of perfect, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, I I truly loved that series and everything about it. it. It it again, I think it is the, you know, and I'm a big fan of, of Brian's. I'm watching uh, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, enjoying that immensely yeah. so. and i i do want to also sneak in um you know also what are some of your upcoming projects that we could see you in as well that you're allowed to uh to share well uh, other than uh waiting to start the peripheral um you know everything's kind of shut down now you know with a writer strike and pending 
uh, I guess the DGA made a deal, but there's a uh, the S Screen Actors Guild members uh, voted uh, for a strike authorization. So we went into negotiations on Wednesday, yesterday. And uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I did a an episode of Quantum Leap, which will be, um, they went straight from season one into season two because of the pending strike. And so it's not gonna air until the fall, but uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience. I, I, um, I always appreciate, especially nowadays, getting to play a character that is uh, pretty wholesome and, uh, you know, and fun. So I play a, uh, a sheriff in 1949, New Mexico. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was really, uh, really fun. And it, I, it, it's a huge part too. I mean, as far as like guest stars, when you usually do a guest star, I mean, you, I don't know. You, I, 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 there were so many scenes. I was like, Holy moly. But, uh, it was an, and, and another great experience, uh, you know, Raymond Lee's a great guy and Caitlin there. And that's another really lovely group of people. Um, you know, that's the whole thing. That's so much of what this industry is about. You know, you, you do get on shows sometimes and it's not the greatest experience with the, the, the people, but uh, for the most part it is. And that, that's what, that's a great deal of what makes the struggle over the years you know, worthwhile. But is that's it, about it. I mean, I, I I do have something else coming up. I, I can't really talk about it right now just because it's not a done deal and don't want to talk about that. That's that's what we always use as an excuse for, for round two, right? Uh, but yeah. is, is there still someone that, and you've worked with, with many legends, but is there still someone that you haven't worked with that you're still hoping that you can work with someday? Um, uh, sure. I'm sure I could come up with a number of people. Um, I, you know, I, I worked with someone very briefly, uh, but it was such a, a good experience that, that I would like to work with him on a, a larger scale. And that's Brad Pitt. I did a tiny little part in Benjamin Button. Oh, wow. Worked with him and he is a wonderful human being. Another mensch you know just a good guy he um treated me really really well and and all the people that were there i did this scene in uh benjamin button where they're having a birthday party for he and kate blanchett's uh one-year-old kid and so they had couples there with their actual one-year-old kids you know or babies and and of course when brad Pitt is on a on a set you know everybody other than the crew you know is used to it you know all the the background and everybody they're just like watching him all the time and of course he's you know staying in, in his character and everything but whenever he'd make eye contact with one of them he would talk to him and what's your baby's name he was really really uh you know he made it quite an impression on me he really did it, you know just from the standpoint of he's such a huge uh star and he's very humble and he's a good guy. So I, and, and I admire his work. I was thrilled that he won all the, you know, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood was such a brilliant movie. Now there's a guy I'd like to work with Quentin Tarantino. And, yes. you know, every actor wants to work with Quentin. Uh, he's one of my favorite filmmakers by far. And I did meet him. He was at the premiere of the last exorcism because Eli Roth is a friend and Eli produced that. They've worked together. I'm I'm sorry. They've worked together a lot, Quentin and Eli Roth. Yeah. Uh, so I, you know, I'd love nothing more than to to work with him. I mean, I, I'd uh, be a, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be a water carrier in a, in, a, in a film just to to uh, experience that. But like I say, every actor wants to work with him. So. Yeah, the two the two filmmakers that I get a lot uh, during these interviews, one is Martin Scorsese and number two is Quentin Tarantino. Uh, and yeah, I mean, Brad was phenomenal in, in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You mentioned Steve McQueen, too. We got to see a little bit of taste of him as yeah. well. And Brad Pitt being yeah. a Steve man. Of course. Right? Did, that, did that give any uh, kind of memories for you? Kind of that era and being a stuntman kind of earlier? Oh, my God. I love that movie. Me too. I love that movie. Al Pacino was great, too. Everybody. Everybody. Just it was just fantastic. And I love, you know, um, 
you know, like people complain about the length of some of his movies or they complain about the violence and everything. And it's just, you know, it works so well. He he's just brilliant. Uh, he really is. I mean, uh, I watched, uh, I've watched Pulp Fiction num numerous times. I've watched Inglorious Bastards. I mean, uh, numerous times. I just like can't get enough because you, you can always find some little gem in there that you maybe missed. Um, but getting back to the the uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I I grew up my a lot of formative years were the seventies, so I remember the seventies very well. I graduated high school in seventy four, so you know graduate high school at seventeen and seventy four. So the rest of the seventies were were very eventful, and uh, and I'm damn glad that I lived in that uh, that decade at that time. It was pretty fabulous. Um, so yeah. And then, of course, I moved to L.A. in the be very beginning of 82, in January of 82. So there was still a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that 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 was, I, I think it was set in 68, was it? Or whenever the Manson murders happened? Yeah, but, 68, 69, uh, yeah. Yeah. And my buddy, uh, James, uh, J uh, James Landry, Hebert, uh he... He played uh, Tex, or I think Tex, the one that Brad Pitt beats up. Yeah, and the and uh, yeah, I think Tex Tex was um, I'm forgetting the actor's name that just played Elvis, but it was the the other guy, the one that he beats up. Some told him to change his tire, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, he played Slim in in Westworld, and yeah, yeah. He, he's on a tear. He did uh, 1883. He's doing Kevin Costner's Horizon right now. Yeah. Uh, he'd be a great guy for you to interview. I can pass a word on if you want. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, he's a he's he's a Louisiana boy. He's he's a he's a he's a good friend. He's a great guy. I talented, know. talented guy. He's one of those guys that when you when he's on the screen, you don't pay attention to anybody else. You know, he just. But uh, no, we we'd love it. And and Lewis, I want to be respectful of your time, and I definitely want to steal some uh, some more time for for round mm -hmm. two. I can't thank you enough for uh, for joining us today and obviously walking through, um, you know, your long journey. And obviously, I, I love jumping into projects, but, you know, having a long history of 45 plus years in the business, I loved uh, for you kind of walking us through. And I know our fans who are aspiring actors and screenwriters and filmmakers, they really get good value. And myself, obviously, you know, getting to kind of hear that journey and, um, you know, keep up the, uh, the brilliant work. And thank I'm you. really excited to see your upcoming projects as well. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, buddy. It's my pleasure. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Okay, buddy. Awesome.